You know, for instance, we always say that during the first week, we say yes to everything and we try out everything we possibly can. Uh -huh. And during the second week, we say no to most everything. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Friday, everybody. I'm Brendan Bradley with the Fifth Wall Forum, committed to bringing together industry insiders from the theater and technology worlds to create opportunities for new kinds of virtual performance. And today I'm having a conversation with Joshua William Gelb, a director, performer, and librettist currently making internet theater in his club closet at Theater in Quarantine. Today's conversation is brought to you by the Fifth Wall Forum Discord channel, a robust community of hundreds of technologists and artists sharing job postings, tutorials, upcoming performances, and the home of Artifact Friday, where our mentors and collaborators share artifacts from their work, giving Fifth Wall Forum members a first glimpse at the latest in innovation and immersive storytelling. Find out more at our website at fifthwallforum.com. That's 5-T-H-W-A-L-L-F-O-R-U-M.com. And now let's get to the conversation. Hey, Joshua. Hey there. How are you? I'm good. I'm just figuring out my inputs as always. Aren't we all? That might be better. Oh, that's going to be better. Oh, that sounds lovely. Yeah, you know, I'm always reconnecting and disconnecting things. Uh, so the whole system is constantly a bit of a mess right now. Indeed. Indeed, it is always evolving. My master's at uh, Carnegie Mellon, which was probably useful there because I was studying with uh, Marianne Weems from the Builders Association. And, you know, she got me really into messing around with technology in live performance on stage. And so the integration of, you know, video design. So basically, you know, I kind of kept playing with that a little bit once I was back in New York. And then... As COVID hit, it was just a matter of like reverse engineering all of my, everything I had learned previously and sort of bringing the technology or rather the live performance to the technology. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so fascinating because I'm, you know, I've been talking to like Kevin Labson and now, now talking to you and, and I feel like you're all on this extreme side of, uh, of the digital revolution, right? And you're like, you're fully digital and, and I, I sometimes feel like I pale in comparison. No way. No way. Know, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm, I, and I'm happy with that, but like, you know, like really limiting myself to some very basic theatrical tools uh, in order to just like begin comprehending the digital element. Well, I think you're selling yourself short because honestly, what you have created is the essence of the entire virtual theater movement. What has been so exciting for me to watch is, look, none of us are China with a live hologram performance, right? Like, yeah. we're all slumming it here. Mm -hmm. And you have created this very elegant handshake between what I think the community is ready to understand. Because there is now with this very weird conversation about, like, what counts as theater, um, oh, so which is so weird, um, particularly from institutions that, like, decided that, one of the answers was no theater to just like shudder. And I was like, well, that's, that can't be our the theatrical tradition in America. It's just a not <laughs> like there's going to be a tradition. There's going to be a dialogue with the audience. Let's figure out what that should or could be. But you, I, I really think it's remarkable how you've been able to maintain the hybrid of it all. And it's something I'd, I'd love to talk about with you because I'm fascinated by how the theater in quarantine has evolved, especially early on when you were first finding it, because it's one thing for you to go like the rest of us, I'm going to just start making some stuff in my closet. And it's very different to then start inviting the community to your closet <laughs> during a shutdown. Yeah, I mean, truly. But that was also kind of the uh, the motivating factor, right? Uh I don't think I would have done anything if I didn't start inviting people into it. Uh, and so like giving myself a stupid amount of deadlines <laughs> uh, was sure. really part was like the only thing that kept us doing it. And I'm learning that now, now that I don't have deadlines or like, we're kind of like off season right now. Okay. And I'm finding myself like, Oh, it takes so much effort for me to actually like get back into the closet and, and try and build something. Whereas it was so easy for a year and a half whenever I was like, oh yeah, in two weeks, I have, I have to do a live show. <laughs> uh, and I really loved that schedule. I felt like I was on like a, a TV schedule for once and it felt, it was a extremely invigorating, like very inspiring. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's been interesting kind of 
looking back at what we know as a theatrical process, which has become so extended and so based in like these developmental showings. And I, I guess I just got real excited by the prospect of like, actually through digital, we can make things a lot faster, mm-hmm. like rely on first impulses a lot more, trust each other. And suddenly like you can have a, a full product, I'll be at one less than 30 minutes, you know, uh, in, in three weeks and, and it's presentable. And in some ways, like that process, whether it succeeds or fails, like that bringing the audience into that process is what's so exciting. And I think what keeps the audience feeling like it has a sense of liveness to it. Absolutely. I think in a lot of ways we've pivoted our tradition of artistry to become that the art is the product versus every artist has such an, a beautiful and thoughtful practice. Mm-hmm. And we've always kind of hidden that backstage or behind the curtain. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, this bringing that into the spotlight as part of the performance, and it can still then result in a packaged thing that you can watch for 30 minutes. But there's also including the audience in our tradition, I think in many ways is the answer to how do you communicate and convert value in the space is that if we keep hiding the work people don't think it's work and if we share the work people then feel included in that tradition i think i love that i mean i think i'm i'm one of the few on the side of of you know maybe this doesn't have to be theater mm. uh, you know <laughs> tell me more about that <laughs> i mean i obviously come from a, a theatrical background and Maybe more than most, I'm I'm feeling particularly tied to the theatrical space uh, in terms of who my audience is and and who my like supporters are. Mm-hmm. But I kind of feel on a basic logistic level, uh, it makes sense to get away from theater as quickly as possible, you know, and not to talk, not to speak to like audiences, mm-hmm. but on a funding level, uh, you know, these theaters are having a hard enough time just putting up what they used to. Uh, it just feels like there's so much more space if we, you know, are able to to break into, as you already have, the video game world, tech companies, streaming, everything else. That there's just like a lot more possibility beyond mm. the limitation of strictly the word theater, mm. which has just been rubbing everyone the wrong way in such a bizarre sure. sense that, I, you know, I just don't quite right. understand. So I'm just like much more open to the flexibility of, of our terminology. So I like XR. So the Coriolanus of there is a world elsewhere, you believe that there's maybe a better community that does want this work? Or do you think we're building that community? Oh, yeah, I think we're building it. But I also think we can pull from many different communities. And I think we're at like a really wonderful turning point, even when we speak about Netflix winning Emmys and things like that. So, you know, it's a really fantastic pivot moment for all of us where internet performance, (laughs) be that live, be that, you know, Netflix uh, is now being acknowledged in structures that were never prepared for that. Sure. And I think theater is just going to be more stubborn than most. And do you think that that will create a bifurcation of this very small definition of what is theater or do you see it like the way that hollywood poo-pooed early streaming culture that's not television that's not film and now it is basically television and film do you see it kind of expanding its definition to capture that audience that is hungry for live content i mean this is these are like the unforeseen questions i know that's Uh, why i want to ask you i know (laughs) Uh, my working theory is that it will become exceptionally important within maybe a scope of time that that i will not survive (laughs) uh you know if if things are going the way it feels like they're going the ability to maintain liveness remotely is going to be extraordinarily important that being said uh it, it's easier for me, particularly in the short term, to feel that theater is going to reverse tack uh, and really push against anything digital for a little while. Mm. But that being said, I, I, I do clearly, like, if we're talking more generally about digital performance, which is to say, like, digital capture, like, that will be taken advantage of and should be. Uh, it's easily monetizable and everyone understands it. And Hamilton can win an Emmy. I want to ask about that, though. 
is it easily monetizable for everyone involved? Can everyone understand it? And where do you see that path going? To me, it's understandable in the sense that like the National and the Met have been doing this for a long time, right? Digital simulcasts have been around and certainly contracts have been negotiated uh, that seem to make it work. I haven't looked at those contracts. So there's definitely precedent. And it's just that theaters, uh, they love mm -hmm. their scarcity. Similarly, we all do. We all love to have that ticket that no one else has a ticket to. Right, but right. that being said, it, it makes perfect sense on a basic production level, if on your last night of performance, you simulcast suddenly to 75,000 more people that are all paying $5, mm -hmm. $10, $50, like it's, it's almost just too obvious. I agree. I guess where I get concerned is once we start trying to take an interpretation of who is it for, because if the simulcast ultimately ends up reaching more people and becomes the more primary mode of distribution but we've culturally approached it as the secondary ancillary thing and therefore we haven't leveraged the economics of it to really capture revenues for the artist to participate in that longer tale to me that's that is the danger of of digital is that where we've gone already is what we've seen is People go, like, we even see this in the 2020 negotiations for Apple TV and Amazon and Netflix and the street, the big streamers yeah. of them basically still taking, it's what the IATSE strike is over right now, um, is yeah. this position that, well, it's still really speculative and hypothetical what this streaming stuff even means. And I'm going, come on, y'all, we have real-time metrics on this. It is the primary mode of distribution for 90% of this content. It's a disingenuous argument that this is not a massive business and a massive vertical of the entertainment business. And yet if we continue to pretend that it's this secondary one-off thing and the real you know, contract is for that live show, I worry that actors and writers and directors and scenic designers and lighting designers and stage managers are going to again be left behind. Mm-hmm. I think those are very real concerns. Have you seen a path to monetization for, I mean, obviously you're streaming a lot of this work to YouTube, which I've done for a long time. And there's absolutely no money or support on YouTube. Um, there's a great audience to find. No. How have you found when it comes to communicating the value proposition to get, do the artist receive any access to compensation or funding or grants, or is this all just, a marketing effort for the exposure of this work in this moment? That's a really good question. Uh, I mean, I think in some ways I'm a case study in the failure of the monetization of it all. You just described my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I say that because like right now I'm coming to you, like we haven't done a live show since July. You know, we've released some stuff. We have an installation in Washington, D.C. I should check in on that, actually. Um, <laughs> but, um, that, being said, that being said, it's like we were able, but right now, like, we haven't done anything live, and we're trying to figure out, like, what the hell the future is for us if we're going to mm -hmm. be doing hybrid, like, in-performance slash streaming moving forward, and does that actually screw over our entire model? The answer sure. is probably yes. Uh, that being said, um, like what success we had monetarily was mostly through various grants and co-productions with theaters who were very excited about what we were doing, but only because they couldn't produce otherwise. Right, right. And so right now we're looking at the prospect of a season and realizing those co-pros just aren't necessarily as readily there mm. some are but not as readily how many dozens if not hundreds of artists did you basically give a path to employment for uh over a hundred total with incredible the, with a couple of them multiple times so. incredible incredible i mean like just let's just go ahead and etch you in the margins of history for having met the moment and really supported your community oh thank thank you uh yeah i mean actually katie rose should be really 
you know, applauded for that because she was the driver of that for us. So I'm like, again, I'm the guy who'd be like, no, just throw it on YouTube and it's all free for everyone. <laughs> Katie Rose has, is much more ethically conscious and, uh, and good because it was valuable to our work ultimately. So yeah, my whole thing from the very beginning was I wanted to be on YouTube uh, because I felt and still feel uh a sort of bizarre aversion to so many of the emerging streaming platforms. Like, like which ones? Uh, I just don't have a handle on them yet, but I don't exactly know what any of them are accomplishing or what their mm-hmm. like what their vision is. Well, they're building content libraries, exactly, so that they can sell them. Yeah, I mean, I I don't mean to be dismissive of what they're doing, but I actually have read a lot of these contracts, and I'm nervous about these contracts because mm-hmm. they fall into the category of the same. YouTube web series streamers that basically aggregated a bunch of independent content, yeah. obligated the producers to any obligations or payments or residuals that were going to come out of that, yep. be like, it's not our problem. And then they fire sold these libraries because they just kept getting bought up by other people. Yep. And what it resulted in was an economic model of just emoji shrugging when the bill came due. Right. And I look at the things like the Hamilton contract and how hard they fought to really bake in a good contract for what this new distribution was going to be. But I don't see that in the fine print of these other streamers that are cropping up. And that just scares me as an independent content creator. And so I I, I agree with you that like, if effectively it's going to be free, no matter what, you might as well put it on something public facing where no one's making any money Mm -hmm. and at least the largest possible audience capture can occur. Yeah. And I mean, it's YouTube. This was always an experiment in, in bringing live theater to the internet and i liked the ubiquity of the platform sure it's everywhere it always has been it has become whatever we need it to be that's why i used it and i liked the free thing you know it's not perfect it'd be great if if there was like some sort of ticketing system but you know ultimately as you said it's a marketing tool to ultimately bring exposure to the form uh and that's been really wonderful up until now. <laughs> um, speaking of right now, uh-huh. what is the now of it all? What are you looking to do next? So myself and Katie Rose, theater in quarantine, are in the uh, thick of making plans. I mean, it's a lot of meetings again. And it's a lot of balancing our intentions to stay digital with a lot of people's interest for us to be in person. Uh, so, for instance, we're doing an in-person performance at the library, Lincoln Center, which is going to be streamed simultaneously, totally free to both audiences. Uh, and that's going to be our first attempt to figure out what the closet could be like in person. Cool. Uh, so, you know, obviously, we'll just have like video screens showing the master output, mm-hmm. the, except the audience will also be able to see, you know, what the actual action within the closet itself and how the digital manipulations take place, um, which will be really exciting and give a kind of a backstage behind the scenes view. Yeah. Uh, so we're doing that in January. And from there... You know, we're trying to figure out if we're going to kind of use that as a jumping off point to a winter, spring digital season, go back to a, you know, once a month, we'll release something new live while hopefully building out some sort of in-person hybrid tour model where we can be doing in-person hybrid presentations that are also streaming, but that are also hopefully allowing us to be building new content as we go. Amazing. Yeah. What is something that you're currently needing or looking for, whether it's a, a type of collaborator or a type of tool or a type of partner to be able to leverage that next rung of the ladder? I mean, that's a really good question because it, it ultimately, you know, so YouTube has been a, a deeply limiting platform, you know, this, mm-hmm. right. Uh, and in some ways that's good. So obviously our biggest problem right now, and very much part of the reason we haven't gone live in a bit is uh, I'm, overhauling the system and getting in a bunch of new tech Mm -hmm. and not necessarily wisely mind you um i think i'm staying with apple which is a crazy thing to do well once you're in an ecosystem it's very hard to leave yeah and very expensive to to remain (laughs) yes (laughs) so that's happening which is exciting um but i'm also just like it's been a great useful experience for me to like learn all of this technology and i want to keep doing that and expanding what i know i would love to have ultimately 
like an additional technical brain Hmm. within theater and quarantine, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, because I do feel like there's so much more room for us to play. If we do start thinking about different models that are outside of our YouTube proscenium, it's exciting to think about different platforms it's exciting to think about expanding the scale of the work, not necessarily feeling like everything has to be in a literal closet, mm-hmm. uh, that we can bring in more performers, bring in different types of performances, and just keep playing and like building out the vocabulary, maintaining limits and, and boundaries, but still like, how far can we go? So like right now, I, I'm really into uh, super retro 3D. Nice. How can I get the audience 3D glasses? Mm-hmm. Uh, because it looks fantastic, particularly on like phones and computers. Right. Versus what our usual expectation of 3D. Mm-hmm. But again, it's all like limited by my technical capabilities. So if we actually had someone who was good at this stuff and it, like understood the uh, the technology, I feel like that would be a really incredible place for us creatively and so yeah i'd be interested in like who's out there that's that's really excited about this work and wants to to bring it to new audiences and not just circling as i feel like i have particularly uh the sort of same downtown theater scene albeit downtown theater scenes across the country yeah because i was going to say you actually have a very generous kind of exposure for the things that Mm -hmm. you've been making in your closet um, and there's so yeah. many artists who feel like they can't get that word out. I mean, have you found kind of best practices or things that have helped you get some of that coverage and consideration? Absolutely. Um, you're not going to like it, though. Great. <laughs> no it. one likes it. You know, you just end up paying a, a publicist. Oh, a okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. What is that process like, though? How do you go about finding a publicist that understands the work you want to create and oh. how much of an investment, if you don't mind me asking, is that yeah i mean sure i'm happy to i'm happy to be as transparent as possible i was very lucky to work with john vishnevsky uh with everyman agency who sort of lucked into being the the pr rep of so much of the digital stuff uh i think he did troll farm i think he did all the fake friends shows nice which is to say like he was a publicist who recognized the work mm-hmm. and paired that with a desire to be working and uh, good for him. John actually approached me very early on just to say how excited he was by the like little studies I'd been putting out. Uh, I don't think we'd even gone live at that point. And we basically just talked a lot and brainstormed. Uh, he was very much creatively part of it. And it took a couple months but ultimately, he was able to get us our first review. And then John was pretty tenacious with things like the New York Times profile, which we got wind of maybe happening as early as winter. and didn't happen until August. But then also other things fell into our laps. You know, NPR fell into our laps. So uh, it wasn't all John. Sometimes it was just... Uh, and, and this is what I think is really... Uh, uh, maybe a bit of the crux here as far as TIQ's success with this is that we did keep our stuff up archivally. Yeah. Uh, and so people could revisit it and uh, and it could be an evergreen story even if people were missing the live shows. Absolutely. Especially in the independent film space, which I think this kind of straddles because you just have a wider kind of audience base to, to go after. Uh, but yeah, I haven't... The audience thing, I have not cracked. I don't think anyone has. I mean, I'm intrigued about your experience here as well. With audience curation? Yeah. Um, What I'm experiencing is that there is a very small, passionate audience for immersive theater using digital systems. Uh And that audience has a lot of crossover. Like, I have now been a part of several plays that have been done in variety of different contexts whether it's just live streaming to places like twitch and youtube or whether it's more interactive on places like vr chat or mozilla hubs and what i've really observed is that when i'm collaborating with other people in the space they recognize audience members and then i recognize other audience members and then we start to see those same avatar names or handles at shows so there is this audience that is hungry for it because they've seen it they like it and they're not going back they really they've they've bought in and then i do think we've seen this swath of thousands upon thousands of audience members that have almost 
in some ways thought they discovered the web series during the shutdown. They're like, oh my gosh, streaming narrative content. This is amazing. And you're like, you're 10 years too late, but thank you. I'm glad you're here. Like, please stay, pack a lunch. There's a lot to get through. But I think I'm excited about the energizing of that audience because I think that they just don't know where to go. There needs to be a celebration of how diverse inherently the work is, even if it on its face it looks identical, because the process is so unique to each performer and each creator. Because how everybody's duct taping this stuff together is a magic trick. Um, so without a doubt. Yeah. And I and I think what is lacking right now is I think about early YouTube culture really excelled because of a company called Tube Filter that kind of became the deadline yes. of web. And I know that there's people like No Proscenium or Immersive Theater and doing a lot to celebrate and review and get the word out. But again, they have such a small capture over who their audience is. But I think the audience is coming because you look at something like these concurrent Twitch streams for a Let's Play video game. And I'm going, you are watching passively someone else play a video game, <laughs> which is extremely cool and entertaining. But what if that video game was talking back and playing back. And I think that that shows us there is an audience that wants to, quote unquote, let's play or world hop. And we've got the creative culture, the creative economy, the training to do that. And it's just trying to get the handshake between these two communities. Yeah, it's so well put. Can I ask you, Ugh. you know, you were a John Wells fellow at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. And... How do you believe we capture the innovation and energy of this moment in our training programs and in our education? Oh, how fun. Yeah. It, I was there with Marianne Weems. She was developing a program there at the time called Future Stages. Um, <laughs> that is accidentally what I called my theater template. There you go. <laughs> uh, and, and so I was very lucky. I was the first class uh, that was brought into the directing program there uh, to be part of this program. And... It evolved over about a year and a half to a large warehouse off campus where they basically just brought in a ton of equipment, cameras, projectors, uh, computers. And uh, it, even for some semesters, paired us with visual artists, paired us with designers, brought in actors, playwrights. And we just started generating devised work uh, with the expectation that it would involve uh, a sort of integration of technology. This was not uh, streaming yet, but it was my way into working with, you know, programs like Isadora and QLab. You know, these are programs that ultimately became the, the centerpiece of theater and quarantine. And so in that respect, I was really lucky to be part of that program that was all about just getting in a room and reading Marshall McLuhan and making a mess. <laughs> it truly, to me, that that sort of becomes an ideal. And, and I know other, because uh, Marianne has since left, but uh, Caden Manson was at Carnegie Mellon for a little bit following and did a similar thing. But that being said, it, like it, truly having a, a laboratory to experiment with tools was deeply vital. And uh, if not more vital than, you know, when we would, also have our, you know, classes where we would just direct Chekhov. So when you start realizing, I like how you call it magic tricks. I, I don't necessarily like calling myself a magician yet, but they are magic tricks. Mm -hmm. You know, you start to discover these magic tricks uh, and the possibility there, the narrative possibility or experiential possibility is just so palpable. Sure. I think the biggest question, the question that remains the, the question I continue to struggle with, struggle with every every project, is how to ennoble the co your collaborators to feel like all mm. ideas are possible, uh, and what is the process by which like we can uh, collaborate given given the limitations of the technology, or you know, in other words, the sort of infiniteness of the technology, which itself can be uh, sort of terrifying. You know, for instance, we always say that during the first week, we say yes to everything and we try out everything we possibly can. Uh -huh. And during the second week, we say no to most everything. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, you know, 
And that's just, and that's just how we try to do it. And the, and again, just like following first impulses, that's more of a creative methodology than, than necessarily a technical one. Uh, but nonetheless, like it, it has been really uh, useful uh, as we speak to collaboration. I mean, similarly, we use a lot of digital whiteboards and things mm-hmm. like that uh, in, because everything we've done has been remote. You know, what are ways that we can be sharing and storyboarding and uh, brainstorming that allow us to find a sense of flow within the rehearsal room? But these are ideas that that aren't necessarily brought up in training. Sure. I, I feel like it's all implied, but it's not necessarily, uh, you know, the groundwork. I totally agree that I feel like we spend so much of our training on the individual processes, but it's a collaborative medium. Mm-hmm. Like we can't make in a vacuum. Case in point, you practically made in a vacuum. It is you, you in a closet, but that it necessitated and involved so many other moving parts and so many other collaborators. Mm-hmm. And then obviously couldn't just be a tree that fell in the woods. You needed the audience. You, you It is a dialogue with them. Mm-hmm. And so it's so bizarre that we so rarely teach yeah, that. I mean, this is, again, I, I, I've been sort of lucky in that both at Carnegie Mellon, but also at NYU at, at Playwrights, you know, I, I come from a pedagogy of collaboration. Hmm. And I think that's that's been very special. And, and you know, now that I, I, I can look back at that in hindsight and kind of see that that's very much the case, uh, but it, you know, everything I've done since undergrad has always been this, this question of like, okay, how do you actually involve the designers as early as possible and not necessarily just force them to make a model box and go away? Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And Absolutely. How exciting digitally. And this is a slightly other conversation about like how we integrate design, but I love the way that that sound designers have become so instrumental yes. as a design force. Yes, you know we treat that as effectively a second text. Mm-hmm. And in the opposite end of the spectrum, we have like scenic design and costume design and video design. Everything has has become this like hybrid design blob effort, uh, and so also making sure everyone is really excited by the prospect of stepping on each other's toes and also conscious of the fact that everyone is going to be stepping on each other's toes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a game of twister. Yeah. Um, for the podcast of it all, can Uh I ask you, how do people get in touch with you? I have an email. That's just Joshua William Gelb two at gmail.com. Uh, it's two because I thought Gmail was going to be a fad, so I deleted my <laughs> first email. Excellent. Uh, no, and we also have a theaterinquarantine.com. We have uh, theaterinquarantine at gmail.com. Uh, you know, we're, we're reachable. Great. Because we love, we love people who are excited by the possibilities here. And you know, we haven't played with interactivity, you know, that there's so much we haven't done yet. And... I'm excited at the prospect of one day emerging from the world of YouTube and and starting to get to play in the playgrounds that you've been playing in. Well, the water's just fine. Come on in. (laughs) (laughs) Joshua, thanks so much for the conversation today. Thank you. This has been an absolute delight. Thanks so much to Joshua William Gelb for the conversation. If you want to join me on the show, find me online at the handle Brendan A. Bradley or go to fifthwallforum.com to find out more. I'm Brendan Bradley wishing you a happy Friday, and I'll see you next time.